Okay. Okay, so uh, we're changing program. So Ika Fernandez, <laughs> uh, who's works on uh, urban planning, um, just to be at uh, Cambridge as a evening scholar. Uh, we'll be talking to us about the Mount Data Peace Accord. I think that's right now. <laughs> More or less. Which, More or less. Yeah. Right. Among other things. Unless there are any other changes. In it. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. My name is Ika Fernandez. Before I start this talk, I want to set a few caveats before I begin. I'm not reading an academic paper today, and I'm not an academic. I'm also not a Cordillera specialist. Um, I'm a, as my uh, same stories, I'm, I'm a Tagalog, uh, Ilonga, working in Mindanao. Uh, I have relatives in Ifugao, but I don't belong to that culture. So I'm a spatial planner by training and a conflict specialist by practice. And I, although I started engaging in the Cordillera in 2011, after the signing of the uh, disclosure agreement between the government of the Philippines and the CPLA, the Cordillera People's Liberation Army, most of my work has been in Mindanao, working on land conflicts, urban violence, and post-conflict reconstruction, uh, particularly the implementation of social economic peace agreements. Um, so it's mostly MNLF, Moro National Liberation Front, MILF, Moro Islamic Liberation Front, and then partially on CASER, which is the Comprehensive Agreement on Social Economic Reforms with the Communist Party of the Philippines. So in the last few years, there have been exchanges north and south between the Cordillera and the ERMM. Um, mostly on the autonomy issue. And I was asked in by both parties, both by the Philippine government and the non-state actors themselves, the CPLA and uh, the MILF, to come in as an outsider looking in to help people think things through. So um, that's, I just want to make that positionality clear before I start talking. No? So I'm very aware of that outsider's perspective. And that's partially why I'm here in front of you, to gather um, feedback and, con and ideas amongst my betters. Uh, many of the, uh, the conversations held back home in the Philippines are under Chatham House rules. And I find it unacceptable that uh, the parties still feel uncomfortable with dealing with academia to talk about this in a very public manner. So um, I'm using the SOAS um, platform to go around it a bit. Um, although I've had one-on-ones with uh, other academics. And I, I feel it's a shame that June Pilbet couldn't be here because she and uh, Finian have written extensively on the Budong. And I'm really happy that... Uh, Sir Tommy is here because the book that you uh, are launching this, this evening uh, already illustrates really well the, the Ely, the, uh, the communities I'll be talking about in the next 20 minutes without me having to show my crappy uh, cam phone photographs here. So if you want to see how these places look like, buy the book outside. No? Okay, and um, while I completely agree with um, the parting shot from Vilia yesterday from Lord that the master's tools cannot bring down the master's house, nevertheless, that's all we've got as a starting point, and the rules of the game are rigged. So that's where we have to begin. Okay, so my talk, I'm sorry, I talk really fast, no, I only have 20 minutes, so I'll go very broadly across this, and then I look forward to speaking to you in the tea room if, if possible. So my talk is um, roughly on spaces of resistance. Question mark, exploring the socioeconomic dimension of the Mount Data Sipat through uh, the Cordilleras Winodnan communities. Okay. So, um, although identity construction is political practice, my interest is interrogating how these political agreements uh, manifest in material conditions in space and place. Um, and we all know, as will be discussed later, that issues of land, property, and socioeconomic development are fundamental to the struggle in the Cordillera, both in the last hundred years and long before. Um, but there's a clear mismatch between the negotiating re rhetoric uh, in the peace agreements and both the policy asks from the non-state actors in the region and what is tangibly delivered by government. So at least two, three levels of, of disconnect and mismatches. And the renewed push for autonomy right now under the Duterte administration, and um, including the current draft for, for federal government, uh, highlights the need to discuss these issues um, in a more rigorous fashion. And that's partially why I hope this can be uh, brought to this group of academics who have been thinking about the region in, in more serious and nuanced ways than I have. Um, and right now, my entry point is an ongoing review of the uh, CBA, CPLA peace agreement, and the drafting of a, a development strategy for the region, which begs the question, how does one approach these communities? Okay, so um, my project has three parts. The first aspect is uh, going through the elements of the CIPAT and the 2011 um, Kosher MOA. 
I'm not sure if people are aware of uh, these peace agreements. Uh, some of them, some people here, I assume, know about it, but others might need a bit of uh, refreshing. Um, the second part is the more technical, uh, spatial aspect of it. Since I work as a land use planner, I work across scales, region, down to urban scale. We won't have time for all of that, but I'll show you a few maps and then um, try to talk through perhaps the political cultural implications of those choices. And then third, try to discuss the possible implications between these kinds of technical um, choices being made and what happens in the months and years to come. Okay. All right, so just a bit of a refresher uh, on this. You'll, you'll recall that uh, in 1970s, um, the struggle in the Cordillera was centered with the Communist Party of the Philippines. I believe the entry point of uh, the CP, NP, and the F was through Ifugao in the 1970s. But towards the end of the 80s, there was a split um, within the Cordillera amongst um, factions um, for both tactical and ideological uh, reasons. So by 1986, I believe, um, the Cordillera People's Liberation Army decided to, um, starting from uh, the faction in Abra, decided to leave the Communist Party of the Philippines and uh, highlighted um, Cordillera autonomy as a clear ask, which they felt was uh, not being addressed by the NPA's rhetoric of um, addressing, uh, they were basically against localization and, and other things, no? Okay, so uh, by 1986, they entered, uh, in, well, they, there was the CIPAT, the preliminary um, decision to uh, to uh, start the ceasefire uh, from a very, very short period of time between the actual creation of uh, the entity, of the non-state entity, and um, the beginnings of a, a peace uh, negotiation between uh, the Philippine government and uh, this group. So it started off like from 150 uh, combatants from the CPLA breaking off from the NPA and into something that we're striving towards a more pan cordilleran uh, identity. So we're looking at two particular um, organizations. Um, the Cordillera People's Liberation Army, which is the armed wing um, trying to defend um, autonomy and uh, identity uh, using armed means. And you have the CBA, the Cordillera Bodong Administration, uh, which had its roots in the tribal organizations in the region. Um, there were at least two, I believe, the UCC, the United Communities of the Cordillera, and the Kalinga Bondok Peace Backholders Association, the KBPPHA. Um, which started in around 1979, long before the CPLA formally split from the NPA. Um, the trigger, I think, will be discussed later, if you'll recall the Sedophil uh, logging issue in Abra, uh, and people, and of course, Chico Dam as well, where people uh, were trying to um, consolidate the tribes for the protection and defense of their homelands, which they felt was being threatened by outsider um, economic interests. So during that CIPAT, which was uh, not just a peace agreement, but an, um, uh, uh, a very significant um, act, uh, the CBACPLA and the MNS, the Montanosa National Solidarity Group, presented a paper called uh, Towards the Solution of the Cordillera Problem, a Statement of Position. And that uh, paper presented uh, 26 demands, which uh, was promised to be tabled. Uh, for negotiation between the Philippine government and uh, C the CBA CPLA. So it outlined the roots of the Cordillera problem as defined by this, these groups and touched on a number of demands in uh, political, social, economic, cultural, military, and even foreign relations. So they said that these demands, if addressed, would end the armed struggle and usher in peace in the Cordilleras. The first demand had to do with Cordillera autonomy. Uh, second, one of the few demands also had to do with the creation of a federal system of government in the Philippines. Um, there are a, a number of twists and terms, uh, turns uh, which happened, but this led to the creation of the, the car through EO220. Okay, so fast forward. Um, so we all know that the two plebiscites failed in the Cordillera for various reason, reasons. There was a massive factionalization between uh, these groups. They were never disarmed, and some, group, uh, some members of the group turned to illegal activities, which significantly diminished um, their, uh, their positioning in the region, and the agreements promised by government were never substantially completed, as usual. <laughs> so this led to uh, a second agreement signed in 2011, uh, which they were calling the, towards the CPLA's final disposition of arms and forces, 
and its transformation into a potent social economic unarmed force. It had um, potent, no? so we'll unpack these uh, elements later and what it means. Because you had really beautiful language, and then, but of course, the uh, <laughs> the outcomes are significantly different. And uh, part of the agreements included the final uh, disposition of arms and forces of uh, the people who thought themselves as CPLA, uh, economic reintegration, and then the programming of a, a number of community development projects, mostly roads and uh, water systems in the area. Uh, and of course, which um, a documentation of the struggle in the Cordillera. Okay, so just quickly, for those who have never seen uh, this, and then when I go around asking Cordillerans if they've seen the 26 demands, they usually haven't, no? Uh, but there, uh, as far as we're concerned for this particular talk, this is the language. Uh, so being able to recognize the primary ownership of the peoples of the lands, uh, resources, and other patrimonies, uh, recognizing uh, traditional systems of ownership over the Torrent cycle system, uh, Respecting the economy of the Cordillera Autonomous Socialist State and allow its consolidation, pay reparations of funds and development assistance um, to the Cordillera Nation, and then respecting the right of the Cordillera Nation to conserve uh, its forest lands and mineral resources, its lands from poisoning and usage, and to maintain the natural ecosystem in the CASS against the act of outsiders who present a different life, philosophy, moral values, and attitudes towards their environment. So uh, this is before IPRA, no? Uh, and very fascinating uh, ways of formulation. So, but as we all know, uh, reality is very different. And, and it splinters upon splinters. So after uh, Father Balweg um, died, uh, there was a bit of a mess as well in 2003. Um, there was an attempt at unification, uh, which uh, between the Balbe group and then the Morina group. I'm, I'm sure there's familiar names, perhaps, to some people here. Not really, no? Uh, <laughs> uh, for, for the old ones, maybe, no? I'm sure you have lots of chismes about these people. Uh, but this led uh, to GMA's um, uh, Gloria Macabal Arroyo signing of a 2001 uh, AO, which allowed for the integration of around 264 combatants into the AFP, the armed forces, and then around 500 uh, combatants into the CAFGU, the armed auxiliaries, and then seed capital. But of course, this was incomplete. And they also had a number of projects called the Kalayaan sa Barangay Programs, uh, run by the AFP's Nadescom in the past. Any rings a bell? No, mostly roads, school buildings. Uh, water systems, but then even the DESCOM was dissolved in 2010 because of corruption issues. So most, I tried to track down many of these uh, projects. Many of them exist on paper, but were never implemented. Uh, in 2010, again, another split. Um, any uh, familiar names? Uh, Marina, Humiding, and Sugiao from the armed wing. And then uh, in the CBA side, you have Ngao'i, and then Sina Mamarsi uh, Bahata, no? And then in 2011, yet, um, so one particular side um, signed the MOA with government only for the same parties to split amongst themselves in around 2013. Uh, and then again, with now in 2018, uh, there's a new dynamics. Uh, the groups who split have come together and split. There's another new group called the, you know, the Balawas, the father and son group. And um, so it's interesting, though, know, because uh, one does wonder if... Um, Entering peace agreement into peace agreements with uh, groups like this is just a form of negative incentive that brings out the worst in uh, in freedom fighters. That in uh, some people were saying uh, in Tagalog, "Ibuhay ng banatan yung patay." That uh, these groups, after um, the late '80s, no longer had any sway over the region, and by just entertaining their demands, um, you're opening a can of worms. But so it's a current quandary, but the reality is these agreements have been signed with the Philippine government. And they, as um, um, other friends and uh, people are working in the pro uh, various provinces say, we, have, we can't do anything. It's, it's, these are outstanding commitments, and the least we can do is to implement them and implement them as best we can with as less damage as possible. Anyway, so no, that's another discussion for another day. So a really quick discussion of the elements done so far since 2011. Uh, I'm not sure if you're interested in this, but then you um, combatants profiled for um, were profiled, firearms were inventoried and uh, turned in and sold. 
uh, there were issues uh, ranging from corruption to from both ends, no, both from the locals, uh, local governments, and and and, um, and the actors themselves. Even a rumor of sex for integration that came about, where female combatants um, were coerced into sexual arrangements in order to be entered into the master list, um, but that was never um, addressed. Um, interestingly, um, a lot of members were um, made as forest guards, yung bantay gubat, addressing um, working with the DNR the, to to work um, on the national greening program. So they they were very proud of this. Uh, when they asked when they asked the combatants, they said that at least um, because we are um, fighters, the illegal loggers cannot scare us away. Um, that's something that at least we have dignity because at this point these are a, a large group of people whose only ways of um, of survival is through the gun. No, uh, a number of people's organizations were formed and trained, uh, but only one of them is operational. Okay, uh, other issues being uh, there was a documentation attempt to write the history of the Cordillera through the lens of this group. It has been drafted uh, by Mr. Bahatan, but it's still in uh, legal limbo because um, they wish, well, government want, and the UNDP who funded it wants to have it open source, but certain members of the group wish to have royalties from the book. So it's interesting, no? I, um, I understand that life is hard and people don't have to make money, but then you do have uh, these tensions between uh, political mores and Reality, and, and as we discussed, people are have agency and choice, no. Um, but I am at a quandary how to read this. So again, language, no. So we have this, and then we do have uh, these commitments to transform this group of people, ranging from maybe a thousand and their families, into a potent economic and armed force within, within the next two years. But the two years started in twenty eleven; it's twenty eighteen. Not happening. Um, they're trying to legalize, no, shifting from uh, from an armed group to um, something like a, co a cooperative system, uh, but that's not worked so far yet. And then again, there is a five-year partnership strategy that's trying to be uh, drafted right now, which should be spelling out um, not a plan but a document that would try to um, to pin down um, projects and activities that would would be economic in nature, that could be funded by government and donors, but still have uh, the spirit of the Cordillera dance as far as uh, development is concerned. And that's attention again. Okay, so challenges, diba? Right? Um, for one, big words, but they're only focused on the non-state actors and not the place, not the communities. Uh, there's unclear intersections with the regular development <coughs> planning process uh, done by NEDA and the ADIS DPP formulation process under IPRA. So even, um, we know IPRA is flawed, but it has tried to do certain things. Um, it's not clear yet. And then you do have these new political scenarios on the horizon. Uh, a new bid for autonomy, uh, a push for a federal shift, and a pending proposal for localized peace talks in the Philippines. So, and with autonomy, right now, um, only Benguet in the whole Cordillera is able to sustain itself uh, uh, technically uh, Everywhere else in the Cordillera is not, ab uh, not able to be fiscally autonomous as defined, strictly speaking. Okay, and which brings us to the term Binudgan communities, which is now being popularized or attempted to be popularized by CPLA members. Has anyone heard of this term by any chance? No, so they're trying to popularize the term in, um, in the context of the Bodong. No? Uh, areas that practice the Bodong or the Pechen uh, um, system, um, they're trying to Shift it now from the old uh, new ones, which is um, uh, the bilateral peace pacts between tribes, into something that is shorthand for a uh, pan Cordilleran uh, indigenous governance system that predates the Philippine nation state, similar to the uh, Sultanates, perhaps, uh, in the south, um, where you have the Ator or the Ator as a space for consensus building for the Ili. Um, and now tr they're trying to translate it um, from, from the old concept of Bodong to a modern Bodong. Uh, where you have traditional values such as collective decision making, leadership, and democracy that might be acceptable for formulating a new Cordillera autonomous region. So, 
it's now being negotiated as a basis for targeting for further socioeconomic programming under the peace process. But I feel that this still needs to be interrogated, uh, not only from a political sense, but also a technical and economic sense. Um, and this is a rough map of uh, a short list that was given, um, still under negotiation, but then it includes uh, core barangays under the MOA. Um, so this, uh, for discussion because while they are geographically isolated and deprived, they do uh, hold a political uh, purpose where they're trying, it could be used as a carrot to um, persuade people to galvanize around this, this idea. Um, and you still, of course, have the ongoing issues between the NPA and the CPLA in these areas where they're still picking off each other when they can. So, uh, I won't go into this, no, but then this is a rough map comparing land cover and um, resources available. Uh, the current economic clustering where you have two major conurbations in terms of econ uh, economic activity in the Cordillera and the spread of um, a proposed ELIS for uh, programming and targeting. And um, again, my current issue is that um, how are we able to now negotiate between uh, aspirations and the language and technical issues where you do have a Philippine government who's now uh, reopening, <laughs> has reopened the Chico Dam irrigation project this time under uh, the Chinese, no? And it's not um, your um, World Bank projects which now have uh, uh, safeguards. These are not even soft loans, very high 12% uh, loans to be dealt with uh, by future generations, no? So, given my discipline, um, and these are areas now where you'll have to be able to start thinking about these areas not only in terms of uh, pachi pache projects, no, na pang kanya kanya, pero when you start putting, investing in these areas, they should serve both a political and a practical purpose. And uh, again, I don't have the time to go through this, but I, I, I want to pose questions. Um, not only to the people like me who work as technocrats, which is like a bad word in the Cordillera, but also for people who work about identity and, um, uh, and other issues. No? Like, uh, how can you uh, manifest aspirations for ED driven development in space and place that goes beyond political expediency, beyond factions, um, across scales? Okay? Because the ED, uh, as I understand it, is standalone. Whereas your uh, normal economic activity will require agglomeration, and you right now have issues within Baguio over excessive urbanization, you're over your carrying capacity. So how do you expand a notion of development, um, bridging the languages of both worlds? And how do you ensure that it's participatory and acceptable to everyone in the region? Hard questions, no, but I hope this is the start of a conversation that we can have. Okay, so I'll end with this. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Father Balbeg. I think they found this in his um, quarters before he was killed. Um, so it's long past. Uh, the way now is peaceful means, but how will the people know if we don't go there? Thank you for your time. So a hundred years ago, Dean Wooster, the Secretary of the Interior, sought legislative control over the Cordillera and Mindanao. Yes. His purpose was to prevent the just forming Philippine Assembly from getting control of those areas so that a sense of nationhood could not be developed. Sure. Right? So now, a hundred years later, are we looking at the re of the Philippines <laughs> so that these people are thinking, well, we're not really part of a country. We're our own little area. There's no sense of Kapwa uh, Filipino, and there'll be no sense of common problem solving. Okay, it's fascinating you're asking this now, no, because um, I, I do have fights with my friends talk, who talk about nationalism. Um, so the, uh, the communists in my, my, my friendship group, like, say about like two, um, there are two governments, they say, in the Philippines. I say, I, I beg to differ, there are more than two governments, there are a lot of governments in the Philippines. And I think this debate cannot be addressed until we're able to expand the notion of nationhood be, uh, to something more plural and real. We're an archipelago for crying out loud. We cannot be unitary. So, but I do agree because they are pitting the Cordillerans and the people in Mindanao 
against that particular narrative. Right now, the BBL and ERMM is being de decided, uh, debated on. It's been butchered. The same is happening in the Cordillera with the uh, the CAR RDC uh, debates around the, the next federalism push. So yes, it's the same story, same sad story happening again. Yes. I guess my question for you is how my mapping of what I saw here in London articulates with your stuff. Because where is the space for the diaspora in that? These mm -hmm. are are people who largely are not on a settlement track. They've not moved out of the Philippines. They're, they're not out of the Cordillera. They're still investing there. They see their future as a return to, to place, as a life that will be lived out in the Philippines and they spend all their time working around home in, in various ways. Where do they find, you know, are their family networks going to be significant enough to represent them, or do you need to open up a diaspora space? Because I can, I mean, when I see the landscapes on the Cordy, they are remittance landscapes. This is remittance-led development. If you're looking at the micro projects, the extensions yeah. of houses, the paving of, of private roads, all sorts of improvements that make people's life viable yeah. in that way. You know, if they've got broadband, if they've got smartphones, those phones are coming in boxes from abroad. You know, this this is a landscape that's being sustained in many ways by its diaspora. They don't really have a representation of those interests, which might be different. So, I, I mean, to complexify it, how do you work that in? I completely agree with what you said, and um, it's uh, well. I guess there's members of the diaspora here, so they can talk about this more. But from my observation, as a economic actor, at least a, a planner, and the projects I've seen that have have lived on uh, that don't uh, fall apart within a year or two are the ones fun self-funded by communities. Uh, they take care of their projects um, uh, more significantly. Uh, they know what they want, uh, and that's why ideally you'd have a more participatory process of planning and, and programming, particularly funneling in uh, diaspora money, not only relying on government and or external funds. But I'm, less, I'm less worried about the money than I am about people who are abroad having a say over what kind of community they're building to return to. So I'm actually interested in diaspora political representation. Yeah. Because it can be problematic for people in diaspora to accept that their families are fully and completely representing their future interests. Because very often their families are like, just keep the money coming, don't worry, we'll take care of it. And yeah. the, the individual interest isn't there. It's, That's quite true. And you know, but there, right, are, there are cash to be treated as a cash cow. That's know, quite true. I know people who've joined the NPA when they've returned to the Philippines for that very reason. It's like, oh, I don't like what my family's done. I'm going to take up arms. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I think it's a great response, but also, <laughs> you know, that's, you're really angry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's, if you spend five years doing domestic work in Singapore, yeah, there's no improvement. Right. Yeah. Quick so response, it's really good. and then we'll continue. Um, yeah, the diaspora has sent me in another direction. I think maybe I'll just rest my question and think about it again during the break. Okay. All right, great. Uh, Okay, so that's, thank you. I